All right, welcome to another episode of Vendetta's Fantasy Sports Show. Leo's back with me today. He broke down the quarterbacks last time. And today we're going to be looking at the receivers. How are you doing, Leo? I'm good, ready to get the ball rolling um, on fantasy football. And it's only January. Uh, so before we recorded, I said that I'm super tired and I hope this episode is shorter than the last one. And I'm already going to screw us up because I have to get your take on the Chargers head coach uh, decision because, well, I'll let you go. What, what do you think of a Rams defensive coordinator as your head coach? I'm nervous about it. Um, I'm, I would almost say right now I'm a Justin Herbert fan first and a Charger fan second. Um, and having a defensive head coach, like, I don't know, you know, it scares me that it's kind of like going to be the repetition of Anthony Lynn where you want to run the ball and win with defense um, and, you know, minimize mistakes, which I think they would characterize uh, the passing game as being more mistake prone with interceptions and all that. Um, and we really want to deal ball. Like he, the big news coming out of like this weekend was that they didn't run the ball in the whole first quarter, which is not healthy for a team, but also, you know, um, gives Herbert a ton of opportunities to be a great uh, fantasy player for y'all and also just to continue, you know, breaking records, hopefully. Um, but everything I hear is great, but I don't know. Everything I heard of Anthony Lynn and Mike McCoy was also great. So I don't know. Uh, he was a, a dark horse, I think. So there was not a lot known about him. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just looking forward and think it's going to be better than what we had in the last several years. So whatever comes of it, I think will probably be pretty good. So optimistic, I think, is the word to describe it. Do you remember when Miami was super excited about hiring the offensive coordinator that worked with Peyton Manning? And Adam Gase was supposed to be like this next genius and super good coach and all that, and he's a loser. I feel like this is the defensive version of that. Like a guy who has the best defensive lineman in the game and probably the best defensive back in the game on his defense um, is getting credit for having the number one overall defense this year and getting a promotion. So I think it's a travesty. And um, as much as I hate the Chargers because they, throughout my entire childhood, destroyed the Raiders every single season, um, I hate to see talent wasted. And I hope that the Chargers aren't on the path that the Texans have been on for a while here with Watson. Um, and then I also wonder whether, like, people just didn't want to go there maybe and be the coach because um, they supposedly tried to get Urban Meyer. He said no. And like you said, there are other candidates that I think are probably more ready and have that head coach demeanor that I just by looking at this dude and hearing him in a few press conferences doesn't have. But we'll see. All right, receivers. So same thing, just a reminder, just like we did with the quarterbacks. Uh, we're only doing weeks one through 16, so only the relevant weeks. Um, half PPR, the rankings between half and full PPR aren't going to change in terms of the only relevance to that is just the total number of points that the receivers accrued um, that we'll be discussing. So let's get right into it. Number one was Devontae Adams. Uh, 287.3 fantasy points this year. And he did that just in 13 games. So he averaged 22.1 points per game. And you probably know better than anyone uh, how good it is to have this guy on your team. You think he's a perennial number one overall for the next few years? So Devontae Adams was drafted number one in a lot of leagues this year. And I think last year as well. Um, for me, I was only in two leagues this year, and that was the case. Uh, one of them is the Dynasty League, so I, I've had him for a few years. I traded him. Um, I traded away Tyreek Hill and got him in a draft pick. Um, and frankly, if you own Devontae Adams, it feels it doesn't feel as good as it looks at the end of the year. Um, he misses time. He only missed three games this year, right? But the game that he got injured, you know, he kind of missed. And then the game coming back, he – kind of missed at the same time he didn't get a full workload so you don't get what you expect or hope for from him um so yeah i think he'll be good. you know he'll be a he'll be end up in the top five um every well at least for the next year 
it, um, his contract is up after next year. So I'm hoping he, you know, it's a contract year and he um, does what wide receivers do in contract years. They blow up. Um, so hopefully he can take on this path. It's just the injuries. Uh, I don't think he's seen as an injury prone wide receiver, but he misses time every year and it, and he takes a long time to come back. Like that first game back is always um, a disappointment. So um, yeah, overall fantasy points is going to be awesome, but consistency um, in terms of injuries isn't going to be there. And then you never know what's going to happen with Aaron Rodgers um, moving forward, you know? Um, so I'll still draft him. I will still draft him um, if he falls a little bit, but um, I look more for consistency and that's not what you can get or expect from Devontae Adams, I think. So in a dynasty, would it be too early to trade him super high this off season? Um, or would you think that's smart? Because what you were saying is he's probably going to have a good season because it's a contract year. Um, so fast forward 12 months from today, and you could probably sell him even higher than what you're selling him at now. Um, but the decision is probably even more difficult then. So do you think that that's – he's someone that you – not to try to see what your strategy is going to be like in our Dynasty League, but um, would you sell high this year or would you wait one more year and hope that he has that contract year performance? And then would you even sell even after that or would you just hang on to him for whatever he can still produce? Personally, I would hold on to him this year just because I made it to the finals this year. And you never know when you're going to build a whole 53-man roster on a dynasty league that is going to be good all together at once. Um, but he would be a good sell now because Aaron Rodgers is 38 years old. So you don't know you don't know he's going to be if he's going to be in um, Green Bay after this coming year. Um, the Packers love to you know challenge Aaron Rodgers and see what he can do with the least amount of weapons as possible. Um, so they might not sign him. And also, um, yeah, just Aaron Rodgers being older. Uh, you, know, you don't know what's going to happen. So, yeah, it would be – if you can get, a, like, a ton for him, um, it depends where you're at, you know, in terms of, like, rebuilding or if you're ready to go this year or, ne or next year um, to try to win your championship. It all depends. But if you're rebuilding or you have enough weapons, you can definitely um, – get a ton for him now and it would be pretty smart decision. So let's talk after this. You know, <laughs> you know, what would be super characteristic of your luck with some of these things. I just heard a few, few minutes before recording this, uh, that Chris Godwin is a free agent after this. He's like, he's not under contract. Um, after this year, they're going to both end up on the same team. Dude, it is just <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, like your team's luck for that to happen. At one point, you had every single running back on. I think it was the Jets or some team. And it was all a product of that. Guys just ended up signing there. So um, so anyway, if you want to avoid that problem before potentially Godwin moves <laughs> there, I have a, three first-rounders in this year's Dynasty Rookie Draft that I'm willing to part with. All right. Number two is interesting because, like you said, when you acquired Devontae Adams, you traded him straight up for a number two receiver this year, and they literally had a difference of 1.9 points. Um, so Tyreek Hill had 285.4 fantasy points in half PPR. He did play 15 games. I don't feel like Tyree Kill gets the same love that Devontae – and this might sound weird because he gets a lot of love, but I don't feel like he gets the same kind of – like, yeah, he is the number one receiver, you know, maybe because he was the number two. But in terms of consistency, I feel like Tyreek Hill does it week in and week out. So even at that point, with him ending up as a number two over behind Devontae Adams, I feel like I would take him ahead of him next year. Yeah, and this was actually, I think, a down year for Tyreek Hill. He, so the reason I traded him away for Devontae Adams was because of I was afraid of consistency. But this was way back when, when um, before they had like established that offense and made Tyreek Hill um, and Kelsey like the, just the center. Uh, every ball is going to go to one of those two guys. Um, Former Holmes too, right? Yeah, and so now I mean I, I'm so happy it worked out. Like it's at least a fair trade. Um, but yeah, I would definitely take Tyreek Hill over. Uh, Devontae Adams um, I think it's surprisingly his consistency is there like consistently getting those 50 yard 
you know, uh, plays and, and making plays after the, the catch and everything. Um, yeah, I, I, I see him doing better. And if, especially in Dynasty, like, he's going to be good for a really long time. Um, he's got a contract right now. Um, so he's, he's good to go for, for a few years. And a lot of it probably has to do with Mahomes. I think he ended up with about 38 touchdowns, we said, in the quarterback uh, episode. And I would say that that's probably, if not average, then definitely below average um, for him and what he's done. So you throw in five more touchdowns um, and just one of those going to Tyreek Hill, and he's the number one receiver this year. So, yeah, I think, as funny as it sounds, I think he uh, he could be probably the most consistent receiver with that explosiveness, with those huge points. There's a big gap from two to three. There's about a 30-point gap there. So there's clearly a tier separation here with those two top two receivers. But the third one was a surprise to many. And it was a surprise to me because I ended up picking him up pretty late in redraft leagues. Um, and the only league in which I made the playoffs, it was because of him. Um, and it was Stefan Diggs. He ended up with 254 uh, fantasy points. Again, he played um, 15 games. And uh, I, it all has to do with Josh Allen, right? So the touchdowns were there for Josh Allen, and they were high, and he was connecting with Diggs a lot, and he connected with him from day one. So I also think that there's not a ton of egos in, in that receiving room in Buffalo. So, I mean, the guy's playing with Cole Beasley and John Brown and, you know, Gabriel. So, I can see Diggs, you know, telling Allen, give me the ball, and the other receivers just don't, not caring. So, unless, unless something happens over the offseason where Buffalo goes and acquires a Chris Godwin or someone else, um, I think Diggs could be right back up here. Top five for sure. Um, don't think that he could jump Hill or Adams just because he doesn't have Rodgers or Mahomes. Uh, but I can see him coming back to the top five next year. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I was definitely surprised. I think you and I talked about this. And I, and I was like, can you believe how high he's going in some leagues? And you were like, yeah. Like, I can see him doing really well this year. And I just didn't believe it because I don't think I was a Josh Allen believer, like the whole um, lack of accuracy and all that. Um, but, yeah, like Diggs definitely stepped it up like crazy this year. He stayed healthy, um, I think, for the most part. And – um, and it was just a monster, like in terms of receptions, he had, I believe the most targets and most catches this year. Um, and so, yeah, like he should definitely be a solid pick. Hopefully he doesn't get, you know, overblown and gets drafted like too early for you to capitalize on him. Um, where he, where he just becomes undraftable, even though he's that good. Um, but if you can get him at a good spot, like he would be really, really uh, good and consistent um, for your team for sure, just because of that baseline of reception that he's, that he's got. Yeah. Now, having said that, in a dynasty league, if I can get a decent offer for him, um, I'm dumping him. And I did that last year. And I might have done that a year too early. Um, only because, again, I think in terms of the perfect circumstances aligning with Josh Allen throwing more touchdowns and he's likely to be throwing, you know, in future seasons. And again, with the receiving options being what they are, um, he could be in the top five, but in terms of making it to the top three consistently, uh, I don't think so. There's definitely some receivers behind him um, that I definitely could take. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that in a lot of dynasty leagues, if you offer Stephon Diggs for someone like Justin Jefferson, there's some players that might take that. And you got a lot, much longer shelf life with Jefferson and Diggs. He flashed a lot of potential. So um, kind of wish I would have kept him around an extra year in Dynasty, but we'll see what happens. Number four behind Diggs. And here's another kind of big jump. The next three receivers are all around the same amount of points. So there's about a 25-point drop. Um, between number three and number four. And here we have Calvin Ridley, which surprised me because I don't know if it was just the fact that the Falcons were losing so many games um, or the fact that every time – I don't think I had him in any leagues, but I feel like I played against guys that had him a lot and they would always bench him because he was always either questionable or missing games. 
And it looks like really he only missed two. Um, and he ended up with 16.4 average for those games. I know Julio Jones missed a lot of games, and he's someone that we're not even going to talk to because he didn't crack wide receiver – or not talk about. He didn't even crack wide receiver one um, status. But do you think it's that's it, that it was just other options were unavailable and he just kind of became the de facto number one there? I think we've known that he's got the talent to be – uh, number one type receiver. And the thing about him is that he's still pretty good with Julio Jones there. So again, another kind of like Stefan Diggs situation. If he doesn't get overhyped um, in the off season and just starts going way too high, he could be a really good addition. Um, maybe he won't be like the number one or, or a top four uh, wide receiver, but definitely a top 10 and top 12 um, kind of guy. And so again, if he, if he, if you're able to get him, um, at a reasonable draft pick, he could be really, really good for your team. Uh, but will not definitely wouldn't pick him in the top four uh, players. In a redraft, do you take him over Julio? You can't take him over Julio. Isn't that weird? <laughs> like, and then, I'm thinking about that next year, right? Because I'm thinking in like round one or early round two, like Julio Jones might still be on the board. And like, it's going to hurt to pass him and, and not draft him because you're like, how am I not taking him this late? But I, I think the guy's done. I, I think in terms of health, um, it's not going to get any better. He just – the worst thing is that he's not even out. Like, he'll play games, and then he'll just get out after, like, a quarter or a half, and that kills you. Um, and just looking at Calvin Ridley as a number four receiver, I kept thinking that. Like, there is no way I take this guy over Julio. And with Julio probably still going late first, early second – that would imply that we should take Ridley in the first round. And I don't know, a lot of people are willing to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't realize Julio Jones was 31 years old. Um, so that's a factor for sure. Um, but Julio Jones is notoriously, like, not a touchdown guy. Um, so it's just that potential of, like, he, he does really well not scoring touchdowns. And if, he, if you get him to score touchdowns one season, then he could just be the number one. But... 31 years old for a receiver, that's kind of tough. Um, and he's not, like, really, like, a high target receiver, or you know. So, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it that way, I guess. Yeah, right. And it's a lot of, like, like, if he doesn't get touchdowns and he needs to get his points with receptions and with yards, and with every reception com- comes a hit, and with every extra yard comes wear and tear on his legs. So, like, yeah, I think if you haven't gotten rid of him in Dynasty already, I think you sell him for whatever you can right now because I think this was the first year where we kind of see that wide receiver one, wide receiver two kind of flip happening. And it might be hard to re- recognize because of the gravity of the name. But Calvin Johnson didn't give us any warning, and he just dipped um, drastically from one year to the next. And I can see the same thing happening for Julio. Uh, all right, number five. This is a guy that um, you also have on your dynasty. Well, case in point for why you made it to the championship. You have two top five receivers on your team. Um, He ended up with just three points behind Ridley with 226.2. Played every game. That's DK Metcalf from the Seahawks. And this is someone who you wouldn't think would be in this situation, given how the early half of the season played out with the volume that Tyler Lockett was getting. And... Tyler Lockett didn't even crack the top 12. So he's not a wide receiver one this year. Um, But something happened to click. I don't know if it was just Lockett all of a sudden getting a little bit more attention and that made Russell go a little bit more towards DK or if that was just Metcalf's talent taking over and Russell realizing my chances of completing the football and and moving the offense on the field are greater when I target him than when I target Lockett. You probably watched him a lot closer than I did because it wasn't on my dynasty team. Um... You think Metcalf is here to stay? So this is a – so I'll correct you a little bit on that. While Lockett was having, like, incredible games, Metcalf was still um, bringing in, like, 20 points, fantasy points every week um, at the very beginning. He was getting 100 yards and a touchdown um, or, like, a certain amount of receptions and 100 yards. Um, he had one bad game against Arizona week seven. But other than that, he was doing really well. Um but the reason being, too, was that the whole let Russ thing was a thing at the beginning of the season or the whole first, like, th- 
three quarters of the season. And then they started doing what they always do and, um, or they started playing differently. What scares me is that Anthony Lynn is uh, rumored to be a potential um, offensive coordinator candidate for this. And if you watch any Charger games, like as soon as you get a small lead, you're going to run the ball. Um, and so, and run the ball till the very end, uh, no matter what happens. And so that's scary for DK Metcalf. Um, DK Metcalf is not like a huge, like high, he doesn't need a lot of targets um, to get his points, but it just scares me uh, to think that Anthony Lynn will be the offensive coordinator. Uh, running back, loves to run the ball. Did you hear who the other guy rumored was um, for OC? I just saw, who was it? Adam Case. Can Jeez. you imagine if that happens? Either one of those two decisions would be horrible. And right. Pete Carroll at the end said, we're going to get back to doing what we love to do, and they love to run the football. Um so, yeah, I mean, what's your take on Dynasty? You, are, are you shopping him by any chance? No, not at all. <laughs> but, but I'm nervous about it. But I'm always nervous. <laughs> um, so I was DK right behind him at number six. Uh, was DeAndre Hopkins. And he was only two points behind him at 224.8. And – in terms of average draft position, I feel like people didn't get what they expected from Hopkins. Um, he did end up being a wide receiver one, but I, I saw people taking him um, last year in redraft leagues right behind. I feel like Michael, Michael Thomas was a consensus number one for a lot of people. Um, and then right behind him was Hopkins and Adams. They were being mentioned in the same kind of category. And there were stretches of time where – Essentially, when the Cardinals were good, Hopkins was getting targets, and, and Hopkins was getting points. Uh, and all of a sudden, I feel like Cliff Kingsbury is getting a lot of criticism for not being creative in his play calling and for putting uh, Kyler Murray in difficult situations. And I think we saw that towards the end. People figured out what happens if you double DeAndre and you confuse Kyler, and all of a sudden that first read isn't there anymore. And unless something drastic changed from that play calling standpoint, um, I don't know that Hopkins will necessarily have a better year next year. Well, I mean, his year was not that bad, though, right? So, again, for the right price, like every other player, right? Um, he He's really good. Um, and he was – yeah, what, what lacked was his consistency. Um, he had a lot of games where he scored under uh, under 10 points. Um, and didn't really have any games where he blew up. Um, his highest scoring game was 25.5 and 22.2. And then everything below, be, uh, around that um, is under 20 points in, um, in half PPR. So I, I see him having a better year next year. Um, we know, like, the talent that he is. Um, and this whole, like, this whole narrative about – uh, wide receivers never having, you know, never being good when they go to a different team, even in their prime, um, didn't happen this year. So maybe ne- next year he'll be better because of the ability to adjust to the new team and new offense. Hopefully, you know, Cliff is there for a reason. He's in that position because he's supposed to be a really good offensive coordinator. Um, so maybe he, you know, he figures it out or gets more creative. Um, he's he He would be someone that you know, would be a sneaky guy to grab a little bit early before um, most people grab him because I think they'll be sleeping on him a little bit this coming year. Um, I think he'll have a better year next year. So this next one, here's the next teardrop. So Ridley, Metcalf, and Hopkins were all in the mid-220s, mid-high 220s. And then you get about a 12-point dip. And we're going to talk about seven and eight together because – these guys, whether this is Diggs or Justin Jefferson, apparently he's always going to be paired with Adam Thielen because this year number seven was Justin Jefferson with 212.4, and Adam Thielen was right behind him at 209.3 in terms of points. Does no one else catch the ball other than maybe Irv Smith? I feel like every time I saw him catch the ball, it was for touchdowns. Um, but the, I don't think I can name who the third receiver uh, in Minnesota is. And I think they just have either like – Cook. Call him becomes who? Cook, yeah. Cook. <laughs> it becomes either run the ball or throw to one of these two guys. Um, 
obviously in terms of dynasty, the guy you'd like to have is Justin Jefferson. He was probably the best rookie receiver this year. Um, slated to have continual production like that every single year. Um, Adam Thielen is getting, I think he's approaching 30. Still producing decent numbers. Which one of these two, I guess it depends on the round. Which one of these two would you take at a higher round? Definitely, I mean, Justin Jefferson, the potential is there. Um, really quickly, though, who would have thought that Kirk Cousins was going to produce two number one wide receivers? Like, at least me as a as the Kirk, Cousin, Kirk Cousins owner, I didn't start him once this year. Um, just because he's he seems so lame, like so like like he doesn't have like big games. He has a potential of having like horrible games, and yet he was in the top twelve, and he produced two guys in the top twelve. Like that's insane to me. It's the running game, right? the third little play action, the fact that you can't just necessarily um, drop everyone in coverage because Dalvin Cook is going to kill you, right? Like why is AJ Brown so good in Tennessee? Because people have to respect Derrick Henry. So. Imagine if he was a good quarterback, like the numbers that these guys would have. And then we probably have a third receiver existing in Minnesota. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. I would definitely take Justin Jefferson. Adam Thielen is in the top 10 because he scored 14 touchdowns. That's not sustainable um, for him or for Kirk Cousins, I, I don't think. You know, it's, it's always harder throwing touchdowns to the, to the wide receivers rather than, like, the tight end or, you know, like running it in or whatever. Um, so I, I think Adam Thielen regresses um, because now he's sharing, you know, he's sharing with Justin Jefferson. Who he's, so he's not going to get all the targets. He's not going to get all the yards. And Justin Jefferson is there um, at the top with only only seven touchdowns, um, but did had more consistent work with the targets um, and getting all those yards. That's more repeatable, I believe, than 14 touchdowns. So it's J Justin Jefferson is definitely the guy to pick. Um, I don't think he's going to be a top five receiver. Um, so I, I, don't even, I don't even know if he gets back up to seven, um, but he's going to be more consistent, I think, than Adam Thielen. And he didn't really get involved in the offense until like week four or five. The first few weeks, they were very – very big on um, having him just sit back and watch until they realized that you couldn't keep that guy sidelined for, for too much longer. Okay, so in, a, in the same round, in a redraft league, do you take Jefferson over Ridley? Mm. I don't know. It, it, I, I would say they're both there with some risk, you know? Um, yeah, I think they're just both in at the same level, and they're just—it's a different kind of risk uh, that you might be willing to take, depending on the situation with Atlanta and Julio Jones. Is he going to be healthy? Is he? Um, I don't know. It's a hard one. I think I'm just talking right now. It's a really hard one. What do you think? Well, and, and the fact of the matter is that I don't know how many people know that Calvin Ridley ended up being the fourth receiver, right? Whereas if you That's ask true. anybody, like, "Hey, what do you think? Where do you think Jefferson landed?" They probably think he was a wide receiver one because you heard his name all the time because mm -hmm. um, he was a rookie sensation. So I think I, – I asked you a question that I don't think is going to happen. I don't think these guys are going to go in the same round. I think, in fact, people are going to reach for Jefferson. I think he's going to go at a higher round um, than Ridley. So I'm going to hopefully look for that drop in redraft leagues. And, again, if you're in the dynasty league and you have Justin Jefferson and you can trade him for, like, a Ridley and another piece – that might be worth doing um, if, if you believe that Ridley's production is repeatable, if you believe that Jones is on the downswing, and if you believe that Matt Ryan can recover um, and get this team going in a positive way. Right? We also can't forget that the reason they were throwing the ball a lot was because the Falcons were down a lot. And mm -hmm. so if they shore up that defense, maybe they won't have that need anymore. Number nine um, – was Mike Evans. So the Buccaneers receiver that you do not have. Uh, he ended up <laughs> at 207.5. So just a couple of points behind Mike, behind uh, Thielen. Big surprise to me is that he played every game. Mm -hmm. And again, he's someone that I feel like is always either playing injured or there's always a question about whether he's going to be available for the games. 
And he wasn't connecting with Brady early in the season. I remember there being a lot of talk about Brady and Evans just can't connect. Brady's going to everyone else except Evans. And then towards the later part of the season when they hit their groove, uh, I feel like Mike Evans started racking up the touchdowns, which is, I think, where he recovered um, some of his some of his points to get to, to wide receiver one territory. I was honestly surprised that he ended up ahead of – um, of Godwin and and I don't know. I mean, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but I feel like Godwin had more talent, and I feel like he, he probably wasn't drawing the the coverage that someone with the with the respect that people give Mike Evans was drawing. So I'm really shocked that he ended up ahead of him, and by by a lot. Like I'm growing down the list, I can't find Chris Godwin. And I don't know if that's because he missed games. Um, there he is. So he's at wide receiver 38. He had 11.9 points per game to Mike Evans, 13.8. So maybe it is that. Maybe it is that he just missed games. Um, what's your take on him being so high up on this list? So he's definitely someone I wouldn't be looking to draft um, next year just because the cost will still probably be there. And then uh, you and I disagree. Like, I don't know about Tom Brady. You know, I don't know when that decline is going to hit him finally. Never. Um, <laughs> but um, actually, so so Mike Evans scored six touchdowns in his first five games. Um, and that, that's all he did, though. A lot of the times he was just getting those touchdowns. Um, one reception week one, it was a touchdown. So in 22 receptions, he scored six touchdowns. That's nuts. It's about 20% um, of his receptions were touchdowns in the first five weeks. Um, and I think the reason that he – was able to do that and as opposed to Chris Godwin is Chris Godwin is more of a slot receiver and they kind of got a lot of those kinds of players. They got, they have two great tight ends, right? Uh, or two good tight ends that kind of play in the middle. They have the uh, Scotty Miller um, who took some touchdowns that Chris Godwin would normally get those big explosive plays down the middle where he gets behind the coverage. Um, and Chris Godwin was also injured. Um, quite a bit this year, including having surgery, which means he had surgery on his hand or his finger, which means that like, you're out for a few weeks and then you also come back and you're not the same guy or you're maybe you're not trusted um, and all those weapons. So I don't know about Chris Godwin next year just because we don't know his situation, what team he's going to be on. Um, and even if he is with the Bucks, like and Brady, you don't know about Brady, you don't know. Who's going to be there? Uh, what's up with Antonio Brown and Gronkowski and all that? Um, but definitely, I would stay away from Mike Evans uh, just because of lack of consistency, which has been the case um, for a while. Like, he, he kind of he's a big play kind of guy. Um, and that's just not reliable on a game-to-game -game basis. At the end of the year, he's going to end up in a top 12 for sure. But that he's definitely not reliable game-to-game. -game. Um, he scored under 10 points four, five, six times at least. And he didn't really have a blow-up game. He didn't have a single game over 20 points. He had one game over, over 20 points um, against Detroit um, at the end of the year, but that was it. So not, yeah, not, not reliable No, and didn't even blow up in the other games where he was um, a startable receiver. Yeah, he's someone I'm definitely, especially for the price that you're likely going to have to pay for him just because of the name recognition. Um, in redraft leagues, for sure, he's he's going to be way out of my reach. Number 10 is someone who I want really badly in Dynasty um, because he's going to be a free agent, and I don't think he's going back to Chicago. Allen Robinson ended up with 207.2 points, played every game, same average as Mike Evans, um, with – Mitchell Trubisky as his quarterback. So if he goes, there's maybe a handful of teams that I feel like could have a worse quarterback situation than what they have in Chicago. So I just see nothing but improvement there. And if you ask any random person, did you know Allen Robinson, where he ended up? I guarantee that not a lot of people can say that he was a wide receiver one. Um, so in Dynasty, I'd be willing to give up a pretty substantial package for him, but I don't think I would have to because I don't think um, 
I don't think the same name recognition is there. And I think that when people think of Robinson, I think his stock would much, much higher leaving Jacksonville than it is leaving Chicago. Um, what do you think about him? Yeah, he's one of those guys that um, has been unfortunate every year and has played with a bad quarterback. Um, I think the last like good season, well, he had a good season this year, I guess. Um, but like really, really good season he had was back in Jacksonville. I mean, ever since then, he's hasn't really um, been recognized uh, for his talent. And he's had to really earn those um, those points because he's with a bad uh, in a bad situation. So I, I really agree with you if, like you said, it can't get worse, right? Um, hopefully, poor guy. It probably will get worse. Um, and he's, and again, like you said, I think everything you said was perfect. Um, you're probably not going to have to pay a ton for him because he is not a flashy guy. He's not a name that you hear. Like you, like you said, you hear uh, Justin Jefferson all the time. Um, and he's really hyped. Allen Robinson is a total opposite. He's really good. Um, as well, but he is not hyped at all. And this year, um, he was the third most targeted guy, um, wide receiver with 146 targets, catching 100 of them. Uh, with that many targets from a different quarterback, I'm pretty sure he can catch a few more than 100, 100, um, 100 balls. And he, yeah, he he's definitely can be a top guy, if not just a really consistent, solid guy for your team. Um, and again, he's one of those guys you're not going to have to pay for. So I guess I'm just reiterating everything you said. He, he is awesome. He's undervalued, under hype, which is good for those who do their research um, and can go grab him in the later rounds. Um, I'm terrified of someone like Kansas City being able to somehow pull out their magic and swiping him in the offseason. Can you imagine? And it's just like... It's just something that would happen. I feel like in recent years, these high-priced free agents that you think wouldn't go to places where there seems to be no money is exactly where they end up. So um, whether he goes there or Green Bay or something like that, um, I think it's going to be good for those franchises, for him and for fantasy owners. Behind him, there's another double-digit drop. There's about a 12-point drop between him and wide receiver 11. And other than Thielen and Ridley – he was the only wide receiver one to miss a game and still end up in wide receiver one territory. Um, and that was Keenan Allen. So Allen is probably – a lot of players get um, recognition for being great route, runner, route runners, and I feel like a lot of times um, the label best route runner gets thrown around very lightly. And I really think that that does apply to Keenan Allen. Um, I paid special attention to that this year because you over the years have told me that that's something that he gets a lot of praise for. And I don't think anybody is better at getting open faster um, than Keenan Allen. And for a rookie quarterback who is used to wide open windows, that's probably the best thing that you can have. And that's something that Herbert, I think, definitely benefited from. Yeah. And then, like I said, unless the head coach that gets hired completely ruins everything, um, I think he's going to be in that wide receiver one territory for a while, and I think he could creep up within that rank. Yeah, um, he had a good season. Um, his touchdowns were up from the last few years, um, but he can definitely score a lot more. I feel like this is his new baseline of around eight touchdowns, 100 receptions. Um, and, yeah, he missed one game, I think, but also – um, he wasn't really there for the game against Las Vegas. That he was more of a, a decoy just to not let the Raiders know whether he was going to start or not. He did start, I think, just probably because otherwise they would have gotten fined for lying on their injury report, but was there for like two plays um, and then left the game for the rest of the left the rest of the game. Um, he's yeah, his production is so replicable year to year, right? Like. It's, he can be playing a top defense, but still end up with 10, 10 receptions and like 50 yards at least. You know, that's, that's a solid um, baseline for him to have. Um, so I think he's, he's a guy that you probably won't have to overpay if you don't live in San Diego or L.A., but realistically only San Diego. I don't think anybody knows who he is in L.A. either. Um, and his success is replicable. And I was Justin Herbert there, and um, it's, it just makes sense. He, he's someone – um, that you can throw the ball to that you know is going to catch it um, because 
he's going to be open and they're going to be, you know, easy routes um, or easy, uh, quick routes to him. So he's, he's definitely a good pickup um, in all in all types of leagues, PPR format for sure. Yeah, and so is the last guy that cracked wide receiver one. Like year after year, I'm surprised that he's good and relevant. This year, I'm super surprised that he was this good. Um, Robert Woods ended up with 194 and a half points, played every game. Um, I know there were injuries to Cooper Cup throughout the year. Um, I don't think there were as many receiving options from the backfield as they typically are for the Rams. But Robert Woods, you talk consistency, like – that guy is going to give you wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver one, wide receiver two points every single year. Um, I traded him away in Dynasty like two, three years ago, and I regret it um, just because he's not a superstar. He's not going to – he alone will not win you a week. Very rarely will he have an explosive game. Um, but he's always going to give you double-digit points uh, just in terms of your receptions and yards. So – I don't see that. I don't see the Rams chasing a particular receiver this offseason. So I think that he could be here to stay. Um, maybe not wide receiver one, but definitely in that middle range. And he's someone I'll target in redraft leagues just because I know he'll be cheap. He doesn't have that name recognition. Yeah, that's exactly right. That, that's, that's the cool thing about him. Uh, you can probably get him for cheap. And in the last three seasons, um, he's he's had 86, 90, and 90 receptions. Um, and so, again, that's something that's replicable for him. That's something that um, he's not relying on the on the touchdowns, but he does have um, big plays every once in a while um, that can win you a week. Uh, generally, he'll just be a solid uh, contributor, but every once in a while, he'll win you a week. Um, and, again, it's replicable, and he'll probably uh, come at a cheaper price. Cool. So that was the top 12. So all the wide receiver ones um, for 2020, just like we did with quarterbacks, I'll run through the names of just the wide receiver two, see if anything stands out, and then we'll wrap it up. So just missing wide receiver one, we had Tyler Lockett, then A.J. Brown, Amari Cooper, CeeDee Lamb, Robbie Anderson, Juju Smith-Schuster, Terry McLaurin, Deontay Johnson, Cole Beasley, D.J. Moore, Chase Claypool, Cooper Cup. I am surprised that Juju ended up ahead of Deontay. Because I feel like I kept hearing Deontay Johnson, and every time that I saw a game, I saw Deontay Johnson getting a ton of receptions and a ton of targets. Um, I know he missed a game, but that was something that stood out to me. The Amari Cooper, CeeDee Lamb being right next to each other is something that stands out. It could be a kind of Adam Thielen, Justin Jefferson, slash Stephon Diggs situation for years to come. Um, because I feel like Michael Gallup is a forgotten one there. And then the other guy that, that I'm surprised um, felt this hard was Cooper Cup. Uh, he barely cracked wide receiver two territory. Anything stand out to you? What stands out to me after looking at this list and thinking about the guys that, you know, had uncharacteristically bad years or injuries is that the top 12 can really be shaken up next year completely with – if you believe in Juju, I don't know I, that I do, but if you believe in Juju, um, uh, Julio Jones, uh, Kenny Galladay, who was pretty much out the whole season. Um, who are the, What other guys do I have in my teams? Um, if you think about, yeah, just a, a whole bunch of guys here. Um, Michael Thomas, um, yep. number 13. I, I'm missing, on, missing out on his name right now with the Browns. Um, yeah, Beckham. Yeah, Beckham. All these guys are guys that have been potentially belong in the top 12. Um, and there's only 12 spots. So I don't know who the odd man now is in that top 12 list. I like all those names. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be a competitive um, next year. And it's going to be interesting to see um, where guys like Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, Keenan Allen, maybe Robert Woods end up next year um, with those guys back healthy or, um, just having a more standard season for them. Um, but, yeah, that's that's what sticks out to me. Uh, Chase Claypool was an exciting uh, guy to watch at the end there. So, But you don't know what's going to happen with Big Ben. So all those um, receivers with Pittsburgh are exciting, but um, maybe someone you can try to draft late and 
potentially hit on one of those guys and get lucky, have him taking you take you to a championship. Um, Cooper Cup, yeah, like you mentioned, Cooper Cup is one guy that ninety two receptions. That's that's a lot. He had only three right touchdowns. There. Yeah, yeah, and that's it. So it, that could come back as well. Um, three stealing I, wide receivers. Yeah, yeah. I think that it's going to be really, really interesting to see who ends up in the top 12 next year. This just tells me that there's a lot of talent at wide receiver. Um, so maybe, I guess I'm saying is if you're not dropped, if you're not picking up a Devontae Adams, Tyreek Hill, or um, that's it maybe, um, then maybe it's good to wait a little bit on receiver, um, get a good running back, because those are hard to – come by and then come back to receiver a little bit later um because there's a lot of talent yeah and we'll break down the top running backs and we'll look at that at the next episode but that might be the biggest takeaway um exactly what you just said right now that whole notion of if you don't land a super super elite wide receiver you can still win a championship with the depth that there is um as long as you you draft correctly um We'll do tight ends after running backs, but just looking at this list, maybe even encouraged me like to maybe take a chance on a George Kittle or on a Ty- or on a Travis Kelsey this year in that second round um, instead of trying to go right running back wide receiver. But we'll talk about all that when we go over the running back and receiver episodes. Thank you, Leo, for joining me again to go over these receivers. Hope to have you back for the running back episode. And thank you all for watching.